and the and the faculty of uh, of, uh, of architecture of Porto, which almost sounds like the, the Oscars now. Uh, but uh, but I would like to to of course uh, start by uh, I think that it's an amazing opportunity also to be here, not only because uh, because of the fantastic set of, of lecturers that uh, that uh, that have been uh, discussing uh, uh, and presenting uh, in those papers, but also because uh, because of the topic, because it's uh, because of the fourth. Uh, we're, we're living through the fourth industrial uh, revolution, and it's both a discussion of, uh, of the future as it is of the present. Because uh, uh, basically, we are, I mean, and it's important to understand what is the role of architecture in the midst of all this. Because, us, as, uh, as, uh, as architects, whatever we build today, uh, it is the definition of the future for the generations to come. So, there is a need to reflect. Uh, on how we want our future generations to live. Uh, so there's that responsibility on how, on, uh, on uh, which f future do we want to create. Um, as, uh, as, as William Gibson says, the future is now. It does not even exist, distribute. Uh, so within, a, within that premise, uh, what I want to show today is a bit, uh, a bit of the work uh, that we've been doing uh, over the past uh, years. Uh, I'm going to finish a bit with a project that we have for 20, 30, 50 plus years uh, in the future. But I'm gonna start with, uh, with uh, almost what shaped the essence of the, of the mindset of, of big and uh, the pragmatism that drives all the process that, uh, that we do. Um, and, uh, and, and that will be from the origin of the process that I, that I want to show, from the initial project. But a bit, uh, a bit about who we are before what we do. We're a group of like 30 plus uh, nationalities. Uh, we're spread in three different offices in, in Denmark. Uh, or we were in the uh, like, uh, UK and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, US, and of course now four months ago in uh, in April we opened a big uh, big uh, Spain. Of course, it's very sensitive. Whenever I show this slide in Spain or in Catalonia, uh, I realized I needed to do this one uh, as well. So, uh, so to, to calm down and to tone down uh, uh, the political uh, sensitivities. Uh, of course, uh, like, uh, so we opened the, the office in Barcelona, so the way we say that we split work is that everything that is above the Alps is for Copenhagen, everything that is below hopefully will be for uh, Barcelona. London deals with the work that we have for Saudi uh, and uh, New York as the, the, the Northern American company. And this has been the project, these are the projects that we've been having all over the, the world. There's clearly a white, uh, a white uh, spot in, uh, in Iberia and South America and Africa, and it's because we haven't been, uh, and that's been the reason, part of, uh, of, uh, of opening Big Barcelona, because we haven't been able to be competitive in these regions because of uh, Scandinavian fees and Northern American fees are not the most suited for this market, so now we decided to be competitive, to be able to contribute also in these areas as we've been doing all over the, the world. Uh, this is, uh, I joined Big when we were, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we were all uh, uh, younger and, uh, and uh, and we were 50 back then, so now we are 550, so it was a tenfold in, in 10 years. This was a group back then, uh, we the, did a yes is more back then, of course, everyone was younger, Bianca had a baby face, uh, <laughs> and uh, as, as we were growing, uh, we had the need to, to move uh, to the outskirts of Copenhagen, uh, to an old Carlsberg factory. Uh, apparently they needed 12 meter ceilings uh, to, to produce the least interesting part of the beer, the bottle caps. Uh, and they needed these massive cranes that are still operational, but we clearly benefit from uh, from this uh, from the um, from the from the massive uh, floor heights and the, uh, the, the, the the daylight conditions. So this is our office in Copenhagen. This is our office in New York, in New York, which is a massive uh, uh, open office uh, in the, in the loop. And uh, this is London, and this is us in Barcelona. Four months ago, we were eight. Now four months later, we're the double. And we're almost like uh, matching out the, the space that, uh, that we have left. I don't know if you're listening to me, if you can hear, because I'm also always spinning my head and then I realize that the sound is shifting. So let me know if there's something uh, that you can hear. Uh, and of course, <laughs> if, if you want to create change, there's a, there's a massive amount of dedication that, uh, that comes along with it. Uh, so that's clearly manifest that. But a bit, uh, a bit about uh, to think, what, uh, to, to explain a bit what we do, is uh, it's paramount to explain Big's philosophy. And nothing better than to explain Big's philosophy with a with the two main manifestos that, or the two manifestos that we've uh, produced over the, over the years, yes is more. Uh, five, uh, Ten years ago, and how to call five years ago, uh, yes is more is clearly the congregation of uh, a lot of the architecture manifestos uh, that uh, that we see uh, that correlate ourselves with. 
So of course, this is an offspring of uh, less is more, uh, where Mies uh, liberated architecture from any, any style or history and made it all about essence. Uh, of course, that generated into the minimalist manifesto and triggered the uh, Venturi to come with a why to, to question why the buildings have to be so boring. Uh, and then, of course, Philip Johnson, mm -hmm. if anything else, introduced promiscuity or a sense of, of openness. And, uh, and coolness in a time of capitalism and, uh, and, uh, and globalization, uh, and purely from an observation point of view, he was, uh, he was uh, checking how capitalism and, uh, and, uh, uh, and, cap uh, and uh, uh, could influence the, the, the urban space and globalization influence the, the urban space. And of course, at the time that we did Yes is More, it was also a time of uh, almost like the opposite of today. Uh, a time where uh, positivism, positivism and the, the introduction of Obama to the political sphere introduces positivism in, in, in the focus not only on the problems, but the focus on the solutions. Uh, so that uh, created some, some aura of, uh, of, uh, of uh, positivism there. And the big, uh, and, uh, and uh, yes, is more emerges within those circumstances on how uh, each project or the fortunate solutions of each project evolve and the uh, and, uh, and the spring offspring from one uh, from one uh, or the qualities of some project offspring from one to another, and almost like a fairy tale, uh, uh, an archi comic of, uh, of architectural evolution. Um, of course, five years later, then we we've done hot to cold. And what is fundamental about hot to cold is that here we labeled uh, the, the the buildings almost as what categorizes the buildings is also their performance, and the, that the architecture is shaped out of uh, their own uh, region. So here we see that uh, the regions go from hot to cold, from red to blue, and where the architectures are fundamentally different. So it's, it's also to, to state how, how really the surroundings and the, 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 the local circumstances influence the architecture that we do. So buildings look the way they do because they perform differently. So this is a project we did in, in Qatar, and this is of course a project that, uh, that is now built in, in Copenhagen, the ski slope. And so if Yes is More was about architectural uh, uh, evolution, Hot to Cold is about architectural adaptation, adaptation to climate. And now this year we will be releasing the third book, uh, Form Giving, which is about, uh, which spans from the past to, to the future, passing of course through, through where we are now, uh, so from, uh, from the origin of the, of the Bing Bang to singularity, AI, etc., but passing through and uh, everything that, uh, that we're doing today and how we can contribute to, to today's uh, reality. Uh, the presentation at uh, the, the exhibition started uh, in, uh, in May, so we actually opened the exhibition this time, we weren't able to, to coordinate it with the book, uh, but it's organized in, in how, uh, in the way, we, the way we're organizing the project is how we feel that they contribute to society, so what we call gifts. So like this, uh, what you see, pool, show, etc., is really the way we see every project contributing, and, uh, and that's the way they're organized in the exhibition. Um, and of course, form giving, uh, the name of the exhibition comes from the Danish word form giving, uh, form giving which in uh, Danish and, uh, and uh, Swedish is the word for design. Uh, and of course, like at me, we say that architecture is the art and science of giving form to the future, meaning that every time we're, uh, we're having a project, we're having the possibility to design a, a public space, we have the, the, the possibility or the responsibility of creating that portion of the world more like a dream world. But of course, like the, uh, somehow that doesn't happen uh, as we see reality in different architectures, so we really feel that architecture is almost like entrenched into uh, uh, unfertile fronts a pragmatic, uh, uh, petrifyingly pragmatic front where we let the standard rule uh, our decision making. So we let either uh, 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 financial nuances throw us down and we revert to the, to the standard. We let our clients or, uh, or, or construction limitations uh, throw us down and uh, we revert to the standard. So there is a, so basically when we revert constantly to the standard, nuances can be different but the way of living is exactly the same. Uh, so we're not creating change, we're just doing more of the same. Uh, on the other hand, of course, when we feel so constrained, there's the other vertent of architecture, uh, which is sometimes related with education and speculation, where is a naive utopia, 
where we almost liberate ourselves from all these all these constraints, uh, uh, like uh, gravity, uh, technology, etc. And we we project fantasies uh, that uh, that uh, have no need for gravity, and therefore we create structures that are incredibly thin or uh, uh, or or, or non possible. Or there is the doomsday side of it, the dystopian side, like Blade Runner 2049 where we see global warming and the uh, sea level rise taking an active role in the definition of the future where we live. So we have a hundred meters wall protecting the cities from the sea, and, but of course they cut also the relationship of the city and the sea as well. Uh, so we believe that there's a, there's a third alternative, what we call a pragmatic, uh, uh, pragmatic utopia, where we, uh, where of course uh, we, uh, where we've been trying to design that pragmatic uh, uh, utopia where we believe that the buildings can actually act differently and propose new solutions for life today with the ingredients uh, or a solution for life, a solution for the future of tomorrow with the ingredients of today. Uh, so that's what, uh, after 10 years uh, at Big, uh, well the first five years were, were dropped because we were also like developing some of these projects and uh, why they were being built, some of them were very very slow uh, but uh, after uh, over the past uh, uh, five years, we managed to build this much. And what is also exciting is that uh, now we're building, uh, 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 we're having also this and the discussion. Actually, a lot of these are terminated now, like the Kistakos, like the Google Campus, the Panda House in Copenhagen, Mecca. A lot of these are uh, have, uh, have been terminated now. So it's quite exciting to see so much happening. And uh, what is also exciting is to see that uh, when we're talking about architecture, there's always this idea of signature architects. But uh, what, we, what we like when we see the work that we do is also to see that really architecture, our architecture looks different because in each one they perform differently. Uh, but of course this, this mindset, or this pragmatic mindset, or this objective mindset, emerged out of, uh, out of the origins of the, uh, the, of the VM houses in Copenhagen, where this was a building that uh, <coughs> that we were asking between the outskirts of Copenhagen. Now it's an area that has been completely developed, but then was, this was one of the first buildings in Odestad. And, uh, and because uh, basically no one wanted to live there, they needed to, the municipality needed to, to make it attractive to, to people and, and to developers. So they enabled uh, developers to build up to uh, buildings with 18 meters depth, 16 to 18 meters depth. This floor housing is terrible for, uh, due to daylight conditions. Uh, so what we started investigating was what if you create every single building, every single unit, like a duplex. We need, of course, daylight to come in. And of course, we organize all these duplexes almost like as a, as a three-dimensional Tetris that uh, enables us, now we can't uh, visit, see, that enables uh, you to, to, to combine. Every apartment has, a, has, a, has a two floors, light comes in, but also you minimize circulation. So again, you minimize expenditure to, where, to the area that you don't sell, because you don't sell the corridor, you sell the apartments. So again, uh, as an investor, it's far more tempting to have a solution like this, both because it, uh, it gives uh, a better apartments for the users, but it also gives you better revenue and more revenue because you're just maximizing square meters, sellable square meters. So each uh, corridor is almost like an experience, uh, and uh, once you get in, uh, then you have these uh, mesmerizing uh, duplexes bathed in, uh, in light, looking down. Even the decision of, uh, of the balconies, was a very dramatic decision because it's the only way you can span out that much and uh, and hold on uh, and uh, and hold on uh, uh, and hold on with a with a diagonal rod. So that's the most efficient way of creating a balcony that big. So in order to create generous balconies, this was the optimal solution. Uh, so in a way, and then of course in the end, as a tribute to our first client, we we made this space in the building. Uh, but this was a but this was almost like a this first project was. A, Really showed us how we could uh, we could uh, reason uh, and uh, and create value with uh, with the traditional uh, and uh, and conventional ingredients. So really showed us how to create uh, uh, fantastic uh, experiences with with a building that otherwise is is extremely pragmatic. Uh, and of course, the clients like this portrait so much, or uh, or, or because he sold eighty percent of the apartments in the second, in the first Sunday that it was for sale. Uh, then he gave us the building next door, which is the mountain. Uh, so of course I'm a, I'm a fond of, of the mountain because uh, I just had to sell to sell my apartment uh, at the mountain to, to move to to Barcelona. Uh, so uh, I kind of miss it. Uh, in Barcelona, it's slightly more packed. 
Uh, but it's, it's the, the mountain is almost the first project that, uh, that we call uh, programmatic alchemy, where we merge two projects for mutual benefit. So here again, in this area, this is of course in the same neighborhood as the VM. So again, the, part of also the incentives was that uh, no developer had to build uh, parking because the parking houses were being uh, done by the municipality. So uh, in this plot, we had to combine a parking house and, uh, and, uh, and uh, of course, a, a housing unit. And of course, uh, clearly, uh, that wouldn't benefit anyone because you would see that uh, you would see down to the parking houses. So what we've done is that, of course, a parking house needs a roof and the houses ideally want to stagger or to sit facing south and everyone wants a terrace. So that's precisely what we did. The slope is oriented towards south, the ramp, of the parking slide, the slopes up and is protected by the houses. And here we can see, but of course, every single unit has a terrace facing south. Uh, so this is how the building looks, is what my, my daughter used to refer, where do you live? I live in the stairs building. Uh, because it looks, uh, of course, uh, for obvious reasons, like a stair. From one side, it addresses the scale of, uh, of uh, the rest of the development. Uh, on uh, the nine stories, and on the other side, it steps down to the scale of the single family houses. So it really coexists with the different, uh, with the two dualities of, uh, of, uh, of the neighbors. Uh, you, you get in by this uh, uh, diagonal elevator that is a standard product in, uh, in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, as you look down, you see this uh, cascading uh, array of colors. Uh, and as you approach your house, then you enter in a completely different world. Again, completely, uh, it's an L-shaped plan, completely, uh, 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 completely glazed on one end. Uh, these are actually my neighbors, and they were uh, 10 years uh, older when I met them, uh, but, uh, they, and they had two kids. Uh, but this is their flat, and so I just live next door. But it, the apartment is completely open uh, towards south, so you have constant uh, daylight. You have these fantastic terraces that are almost as big as the apartment, and they have this uh, deep balcony so that, of course, you don't look down to the neighbors, so it enables you to, to have planters, but it also enables you to have a privacy. Uh, also, the, the, the terraces are connected because of fire reasons, because you need to escape through your neighbors. So you could actually, we open the door of the terrace and our daughters would, uh, would play together. So there's also this sense of privacy, but community uh, in the same building. And, uh, and of course, uh, what is also interesting is that because here we're doing a full building that is roof and green roof, we reuse the water, we have sand beds in the terraces that slow down the process of, uh, of water drainage, and we reuse the water, of course, to, uh, to, uh, for, the, for the plants in general. So, and, uh, so then we step to the eighth house. So you see the mountain and the VM are there at the bottom, and the eighth house was, this, uh, was at the very end of the development. Uh, at the end, uh, at the beginning when we started doing it, there was nothing around. Now this is full of houses, but the eight house really had to survive as its standalone community. It was also a completely different uh, animal, like uh, it was like uh, the, the mountain was 80 <coughs> units, whereas the eight house was 500 units. So how do you actually create a community where there is nothing around and uh, who, who, would love, uh, who would like to, to, to live there? Again, just a phrase that, that uh, the client is again the same. So we have two thirds of our clients are repeat clients because somehow they, they, they see the added value that you contribute to the project. Uh, we don't uh, waste their wallet. And, uh, and because we, because uh, it's really, we see dialogue uh, as, a, as the core basis for, for developing something new because it's only by reaching out to them and discussing uh, solutions uh, together that we can actually create novelty. So the, the eighth house, when we were requested to do, uh, to do it, it was like a, a set uh, different typologies with different depths, uh, but rather than stacking them vertically, we stack them horizontally, where you start actually layering uh, with the different depths and creating balconies uh, for, uh, for, again, mutual benefit. Uh, because the block was so long, uh, we connected it in, in the middle, creating almost like this form of an eight, uh, eight shape, where you can uh, create a shortcut at ground level, and then we just manipulated the geometry to maximize daylight into the portraits. So basically what we create, the outcome, is this three-dimensional vertical community where you see clearly the different typologies and the different uh, uh, needs, where given the layering of this typology, you also create these streets, so they clearly manifest and create connectivity at the, at the ninth level. And the, not only at the ninth level, because we connect this diagonal street, the A-shape, like uh, the street connects from ground level all the way to the top and then down again. So it's actually what otherwise would be a segmented, what traditionally we have a segmented 
uh, vertical buildings where you don't communicate and, uh, and meet your neighbor only at the ground level by chance. Here, you could actually, your daughter or your kid can play, you can live on the third floor and they can play on the ninth floor. And uh, so it really creates this bonding on a, on a vertical community with, uh, throughout this, uh, this diagonal street. So everyone, it's fantastic to see because everyone really keeps their doors open. Kids just go around in between different houses and different apartments and tell like everyone takes care of their own kids. Uh, so this is the reason why it also survived at a time where there was nothing around. Because it really worked as a community, almost as a village does. Because everyone could walk around each other's apartments. So that, uh, that is, the, mount, that is uh, the, the gate house from the south. In Amsterdam, we're almost doing the reverse. Uh, so it's almost like, uh, because it's in the waterfront of Amsterdam, so uh, we flipped it so that the courtyard benefits the, the, the waterfront, uh, the courtyard benefits the building, and everyone can actually enjoy uh, the courtyard. So when you're actually sitting in the courtyard, you're in the proximity with the water, you leave the experience of being next to the water without being disassociated from it. Uh, again, all of these that I'm showing is housing, because housing, again, is the most basic form of architecture. So if you can create change with the housing, you're pretty well set for, for the rest. So the beginning, the stepping stone to, to New York and to the US market was also, uh, was also uh, uh, housing. So uh, this was for the Durst family, where uh, we were given a plot uh, next to Central Park. And of course, by looking, uh, we literally saw some similarities with the proportions with Central Park, and with one of the, the most known uh, uh, courtyard buildings in, in, in Copenhagen. And of course, like, the, the main reason was how, how to bring, or the main, uh, the key question was how to bring the social qualities of the courtyard typology in Copenhagen and merge it with the, with the, with the, with the, with the skyscraper of, uh, of New York and its splint. And of course, uh, the, I mean, you all know that the, the court scraper is, reflects the merge of that typology, where uh, it, it is shaped the way it is, precisely to minimize the, the scale in the waterfront because this is the, this is south, because to maximize views, and to maximize uh, sunlight, but also it is slightly, uh, it is pushed to the left corner because the client was the owner of the tower on the back. So of course we couldn't block uh, his, uh, his views. And so, uh, so, the, so from, from inside, you see how the courtyard uh, is completely bathed in light. So the courtyard really goes from the height of the high rise to the height of the handrail. Uh, and, uh, and you see here the, the, all the facades tilting and moving towards the, the waterfront. Of course, from one end, it looks like a spire from the city side. As you turn around, you have these pyramid shapes, these warp geometries, and as you come closer to the waterfront, you really have this transition from the scale of the harbor front to the scale of the, uh, of the high rises on the back. And of course, like what is also exciting is that without any type of artificial lighting, just by the pure geometry of the building, uh, the building stands out far more than any other uh, building in, uh, uh, in uh, New York. And the second uh, step in, uh, in uh, the American continent was in uh, Vancouver, again housing. Uh, so uh, it was uh, next to the Granville Bridge, so we were given the, these plots, uh, a triangular plot, and another plot that is made out of clips, a triangular plot. So we were asked to do a tower uh, within a, what we were asked to look at what could we do uh, with, this, uh, with this tower. And of course, like we, when we started doing the setbacks, all you could do was a triangular tower, which is practically the most inefficient uh, uh, thing you can build because it, it will basically be only core. Uh, but of course, like the setback from the highway uh, is from the municipality that uh, determines uh, this 30 meter setback precisely because they don't want you to be looking at cars and don't want you to, to suffer from the noise. But if thought, what if once we get, we use the same setback that is just applied horizontally, but we would apply it also vertically? like doing a, 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 a cylinder along the highway and uh, so we did that and we presented the municipality and they said that uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, somehow that passed uh, be because they couldn't uh, argue it against so we actually doubled the floor plate in the most valuable area and of course here there's a discussion again about uh, about uh, about uh, you know how feasible things are and the, the revenue versus the cost of doing something like this. Because of course, we all know that there are structural, uh, completely different structural demands from something like this, but also the revenue that you make out of having the double of the apartments on top in the most valuable area is not even a one to two, is more because those apartments are more valuable and they're the double of the number. And uh, so of course this was, a, a, this somehow went through the, the client as well. So uh, when, when you arrive to Granville Bridge, you have these two towers, so it's almost having a gate. 
when, uh, when you're crossing around the, the, the bridge, it's almost like we have a curtain pulling and welcoming into Vancouver. And then in the other plots, we've done almost like this set of retail blocks that also activate the, uh, activate the streetscape. And in the underside, we all know that the underside of highways are always like gloomy places. And we are proposed to be almost like the inverse <laughs> Sistine Chapel, or a Sistine Chapel of street art, where we have uh, also like a Rodney Graham uh, in, uh, uh, doing some, uh, some work here. And the municipality was so happy by the development that it, they enabled the developer to build two extra floors uh, in the tower. So of course in the most valuable area, so everyone was happy in the end. Uh, so we, we like to, to see that the, this project, out of the same constraints that the, the, the Fat Iron had in New York, and it created a beacon of innovation, we see it almost like yeah, as an offspring, <laughs> the, the, the Fat Iron, and we started nicknaming it at the office back then. So it's really, yeah, this is one of the visuals, and now, of course, uh, everything is, uh, is pretty much there. Uh, now it's uh, completed. Uh, and, uh, and the client, again, was so, uh, so satisfied with the entire process that they gave us the next building, uh, which is uh, a building in Calgary, which somehow manifests the same uh, facade, but with a completely different uh, uh, purpose. So uh, it, we were asked to do a mixed-use tower, where, in the uh, where it was uh, uh, both offices and resin. So of course we all know that offices demand a different floor plate than resin. Resin needs to be far, deep, uh, far, far narrower. So on top, we have resin in the bottom, we have offices, and uh, the building just does the merge between uh, both needs. So what it also creates is that housing gets to have balconies, whereas uh, offices, of course, they don't need balconies. So this is, uh, these were the initial renders, and this is already where, uh, where it is now. And of course we've done, and we work with the, again, we, we, we can actually work with uh, several different artists, and here we work with Douglas Kaplan in what we call, he calls the Northern Lights, is this interactive installation in the entire facade of the, of the building. And so then this is a project, uh, this other project that we, that, we, uh, that uh, addresses sustainability in a different manner. Uh, it is, I mean, now we've seen three or four towers that address, uh, that have completely different uh, architectures because, uh, because the idea and, and the, the reason for it was completely different. So that shaped the architecture. And here we all know that this was a, an office building, what we were requested to do at a competition uh, eight years ago. And it's a tropical, uh, uh, it's a, an office building in a tropical uh, climate. Uh, so what we decided is uh, uh, to design almost like a pleated dress and that on one side is completely glazed, of course facing north because you want the uh, daylight and view, and, and on the other side is completely <coughs> opaque because uh, facing south you want shading and you don't want glare. Uh, so the building, the facade uh, also enables us, the geometry of the facade enables us to, to, to do the uh, unique moments like in the lobby of the building, the curtain almost like a, a opens to create passages the sky lobby is another one of those moments where it really creates more generous uh, areas towards north with massive glazed areas. So in a way, what, uh, uh, what, uh, what we like about uh, uh, actually the facade of the building saves uh, energy consumption up to uh, 30%. So meaning that uh, you save the AC money up to 30%. Uh, uh, and what makes, uh, in a way, what, what we really like about this building is what, it, what makes it look beautiful is also what makes it perform beautifully. Uh, in another, uh, then back to, to, to Copenhagen, in a completely different uh, 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 project, and we were invited to the competition uh, uh, also like uh, seven, uh, seven years ago for, the, for a waste treatment plant uh, in Copenhagen. And what was, uh, what was fantastic about this, apart from being an enormous uh, uh, building, was that was the technology. Because the conversion of, uh, of trash to electricity and district heating was done without any uh, pollution. So it didn't produce uh, 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 pollution, it didn't produce any noise or smell. Uh, so it was a complete different uh, uh, technology. And uh, so the question here for us was how, how can we manifest that technology in the architecture? blatantly, so that everyone can see that this, uh, this building manifests a unique technology that doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, so we thought that why, uh, we thought that like, given the massive scale of the building, that it would be natural to create a public park on top to really enable proximity of the Copenhageners 
who arrived closer to and to, to use the massive area that anyhow had to be built by the state. Uh, uh, and, uh, and because there were no toxins, it enabled this proximity inside. It almost looks like a lab where you see this pristine uh, and a very clean uh, environment. But of course, then we also brought it uh, uh, up a notch. And we, found that we realized that the scale was such that uh, you know, Copenhagen is incredibly flat. So, the, so the, there's snow, but there are no mountains. And the, the, the best case scenario that they have to ski is to drive six hours to Hannes in the south of Sweden to, to do alpine skiing. And uh, so we almost picked up the scale at Branes and pasted it in, a, in, a, in, the, in the ski slope. And, uh, and uh, we proposed that and we uh, uh, won the competition. Uh, somehow, so this is the reality a few years uh, later. Uh, the park is uh, finishing now, being laid out. Uh, we proposed, uh, there is this green mat, because it's a mat that is used from, uh, from Alpine uh, professional skiers to practice in the summer. So you can actually ski all year round in bikini or in a, in a or in a whatever suit you want to wear, uh, and uh, so this is actually currently uh, the, the initial tests uh, of people skiing uh, in this. There's a little video. A few of us understand Danish, so I'm going to pass this part. Uh, uh, and, and of course now this is the current status, so the, the, the leaves are installed, grass is, gr is growing from underneath, uh, so you really see a green park where you can ski all year round. And of course when it snows, it snows, and you, snow is, and you ski with snow. Uh, and uh, because again, because the building is so massive that it will hold that one side of the entire uh, uh, building is, the, is a, a, a climbing wall. So it's the tallest climbing wall in the world. So what we set ourselves to, to deliver is exactly what is being built. This area that is missing facade was the climbing wall being installed. So it's not going to be an easy experience to climb there. Uh, but, uh, and, and what is also exciting is that we proposed in the competition that and every X amount of CO2, every kind of CO2 produced, that it produce a ring of smoke so that the Copenhagen yeah. will know that they would have burned this amount of... Uh, of uh, and of course, we, uh, we, uh, we have the technology uh, developed with collaborators, and we, we're still pursuing this so that the waste treatment uh, plant is prepared to eventually be, have the, the smoke ring installed. We have a Kickstarter campaign, uh, hopefully, to, uh, that one day will enable us to do the smoke ring. Um, and of course, so, it's, uh, the, the, the building is so tall that, of course, it's one of the tallest landmarks now in, in Copenhagen. So hopefully it will become the future. Uh, uh, it, it will have the, the, same, uh, the same sentiment as, uh, as, uh, as the mermaid does. Uh, 